back. I'm back. Uh, I jumped on just about five minutes early this morning just to say good morning to you. Uh, for those maybe joining for the first time or stumbling across this after the live broadcast, if you don't know me, my name is Frank Ferragini, a.k.a. Frankie Flowers of City TV's Breakfast Television. You can see me Monday through Friday on Breakfast Television as well. I'm a four-time best-selling garden author. Uh, I've won Landscape Ontario's Garden Com Communicator of the Year many times uh, as well. I'm passionate about plants, wild about weather. My family has two garden centers just north of Toronto and Bradford and Barrie. Uh, we're also greenhouse growers. We've been growing plants for a very long time. And I come here each and every week when I can uh, to answer your garden questions, to help you through that garden journey, to make that garden of Whedon turn into the Garden of Eden. Yes, indeed. Uh, it is great to be here after my uh, little bit of a workcation is the best way to describe it. Uh, there we go. Some people actually send me messages this morning. Um, actually, somebody wanting to know if my son's available for a pool party. Uh, he may be. Uh, so uh, just to let you know, for the last week, I was in Europe. I was actually in the Netherlands and Belgium on a river cruise by Emerald Cruises. Uh, we toured through uh, many different cities, including Rotterdam, Amsterdam, of course. But we all capped it off at the end with Floriade. Uh, there's a lot of pictures that were taken. There's a lot of content that's there. So I'm going to piece that together and show you more next week as we have a little bit of a recap. But the whole feature of Floriad was growing green cities. And there was a lot of takeaways that came from that with in terms of technology and different things that we can do to make greener cities. Because by 2050, or it's going to be 68% of the population living in cities. So the question is, how do we feed those cities? Number one, uh, how do we build those cities so that people feel better living in them? and that we can pay attention to mental health. What products do we use that are gonna have a less impact on the environment? And these are all the different things that I learned. Travel, by the way, uh, with Emerald Cruises because the Rhine River had lost so much water due to the heat that's been seen globally right across this world. Climate change is happening. We had to change the itinerary. So instead of starting in Basel, Switzerland, we started in Amsterdam and just cruised around the Netherlands and Belgium. Uh, there were some changes that happened last minute, and for all those that, that attended the cruise, uh, Chris and Sue, uh, to Audrey, uh, to Patricia who ran the crew itself, to Kim who supported me through the cruise, we had an amazing time, even though we had those changes that were out there. Flying to and from, there's always some challenges. I have a friend right now at Pearson, two-hour delay, waiting to get to PEI, Flair Airways. Get it together. We don't need these delays. Um, but some of my learnings really, uh, really from the city of Amsterdam. Amsterdam is a city that was built in the 1500s. And then, of course, the Netherlands itself in World War II was bombed. So you get this very nice mixture of buildings built in the 15th century, the 15th century, imagine that. And then a lot of new buildings and new construction with new innovative ideas, especially in the city of Rotterdam. Even those cube buildings that you've probably heard about, some of the cube homes that are there, that's just one example. So I will recap, show you some of those. Well, what I loved about Amsterdam was the use of pots, container gardening. Even though they hardly have any space whatsoever, in front of their little homes, they have a collection of pots. In front of their houseboats, they have a collection of pots. And many of the plants that they have there are pollinator plants because even though they live in this really dense city, they're really trying to pay attention to pollinators like bees and butterflies. And so it's really a great use that even though you have no space, and a lot of the pots they use were just like black rower pots, just black, ugly plastic pots, but it's not the pot that makes the container. It's the plant material that's inside. So I'm going to show that and I encourage you always to make, you know, container gardens, make dull spaces, interesting places. And we can create a concrete jungle and turn that over and make it into a living, breathing area. So I really encourage you to use uh, lots of plants and pots that are out there. Okay, let's uh, see who's jumping on. Pietro this morning is saying good morning to me. Borca saying good morning. Frankie from Toronto. Paula is saying good morning as well. Patricia, morning from Hamilton. Anna is saying good morning, Frankie. And we even got a uh, good morning shout out there from Jane from Ancaster. Uh, let's go back up here and say uh, to Kimberly, good morning to you from Peterborough this morning as well. Uh, Miriam's asking, welcome back. How are you? Welcome back to Canada, dear. How was your trip? My trip was excellent. As we just said, it's always great for travel. Travel, you always learn something. Shout out to our, our friends across the border in Troy, Michigan. We got uh, Miriam, actually the same Miriam's in Troy, Michigan this morning. Good morning to you. Uh, we have as well, uh, Marlene morning, Frank can't hear, wait to hear about your cruise. Once again, we'll recap that next week. 
Uh, wondering how people are making out here as well, because we do have a lot of dry conditions, super dry conditions. I wonder how your plant material is looking at home. What challenges you're facing? Brenda, good morning, Frankie. Thank you for sharing your pictures of your trip to Holland. If you want to check out my Instagram, you'll see a lot of pictures that are there. You'll see some videos that I'm still going to continue to release as well. I have uh, noticed dandelions popping up on my lawn. What is happening? How should I treat this? So, of course, at this time of the year, when our lawns are actually battling drought conditions, so your lawn is a cool temperature plant. Lawns you'll notice in spring when we have a higher frequency of rain, and you'll notice in fall when the temperatures, especially the evening temperatures, cool off, your lawns are fairly green and active and growing. During the summer months, what happens is they do turn, tend to turn a little bit brown. That little bit of browning is them trying to put themselves into dormancy, and the reason why they're putting themselves into dormancy is to protect themselves. By them putting themselves in the dormancy, what happens is it leaves some areas where you have exposed soil. Then we have the dandelions that those dandelions grew, flowered, and then those flowers, you know, they, when the wind blows on the dandelion, those are seeds. And those seeds will then go and find that vacated little areas of soil, land in your lawn, and that's when we're going to start to see some dandelion and even crab growth, crabgrass growth at this time. If you don't have that many, you can simply just hand remove them. If you have a bunch, you can always use Weed Be Gone. Weed Be Gone is a chelated iron. So, of course, it's not a harmful product to anybody around. And really, it's actually iron, so it's actually a nutrient. So what happens is when you spray the, the dandelion, it'll actually almost rot the dandelion out. But you'll notice the lawn around it will become a deeper green. So those are the two options for dandelions. As another recommendation at this time of the year when we're really hot, we want to raise those lawnmower blow it blades higher. So the reason why we want to cut our grass a little bit taller is by cutting it taller, that taller grass will then shade that area under, underground. So that will limit the ability for weed seed to fall on that area, but also limits its ability to have sunlight. So if it doesn't have sun, doesn't make contact to soil, it doesn't germinate. There's a great question though, by the way. Uh, we have another question here this morning. Boom. Um, oh, why is it not showing? There we go. Jillian, my large leaf plant has lost leaves over time and now has dried brown. Looks like this is uh, stifling new growth. My large leaf plant has lost leaves over time. So Jillian, I don't know what your large leaf plant is. Maybe you're referring to a large leaf hydrangea, like a macrophilia, because that's what we do. The loss of leaves over time is a plant trying to stress, it's showing stress. So why do plants drop their leaves? Sometimes a plant will drop its leaf to survive, so it doesn't have as much energy that it needs to be required to support them, but it is showing that it's under stress and it's in a traumatic time. What we can do is prune out to try to see if we can flush some new growth. We can look around that area and see if there's things that are actually crowding, overcrowding. We can look and see if it's been overwatered, underwatered, and then we can look at the leaves themselves to see if those leaves have any markings and or holes to indicate disease or to in indicate insects. If we go through all that process, then we can really determine what's going on with the plant and how we can get it to recover. Uh, you're going to see in a couple of weeks uh, where I shot a video where I lost a clematis this year just because of heat, humidity, and I missed a couple of waterings because I went away. And that, that's what happens. Uh, Carolyn, good morning from Montreal. Good morning, Montreal. Bonjour, mon ami. Um, Carol saying good morning from Ajax. Hope you're having a great time. I think we have a question here from uh, Debbie. Hey, Frankie, I have some nice... Roma tomatoes. The Roma tomatoes are those ones that are made for sauce, which is great, that are now ripe. But when I cut them, cut into them, the seeds are black and no outside sign of any issues. Thank you so much from Barry. So it depends on the variety of, that you have. And then some, some varieties will have a darkish tone of seed. The seed itself, it's appearing black. If it looks like it's black and almost like the seeds are rotting and or germinating, uh, that could actually be a, a fungal disease that happened in the tomato itself. It shouldn't really impact the tomato uh, in terms of its flavor, uh, but a lot of the times when you're making sauce, you're going to be removing the seeds as well. Debbie, what I would really like you to do is to send me a picture so that I could see it. You can send that picture to Frankie at FrankieFlowers.com. Once again, that's Frankie at FrankieFlowers.com. Little, hmm. just need a little tea, a little tea. Um, this is a question here, which is asking about uh, how do you get rid of pill, pill bugs, Frankie? Uh, so pill bugs generally are nocturnal. They're a bug that you often will, even underneath your containers, will find them underneath your containers themselves. 
Uh, removing areas where it's dark and wet uh, is one way to get rid of them. Simply vacuuming them is something that you can do. Uh, a reminder that you can always use a hand vacuum and or a shop vacuum just to vacuum them out of the area. So you can always pick and squish. And then the other thing too is generally they will be a crawling insect. So you can then use diatomaceous earth. What the heck is diatomaceous earth, you say? Diatomaceous earth is crushed eggshells or crushed shells. So let's say that we had some beautiful mussels, some clams. You can tell I think food a lot. Um, we had that beautiful food. We allow those shells to dry. And then we allow those shells to dry. Or even we go to a beach and we find a bunch of shells. Then we crush them all up. And we put that around the base of the areas that are infected by crawling insects. That'll eliminate and reduce some of those. Karen saying good morning from Crystal Beach. Lucky you to be in Crystal Beach this morning. Um, I met uh, one of the people on the cruise. Her son works in one of the restaurants in Crystal Beach. There may be something special coming there. I think he wants to open something special to Christmas to Crystal Beach. Uh, Cindy says, good morning from Buckhorn. Beautiful little area. Mary, good morning from Napanee, Ontario, in eastern Ontario. Good morning to you. Jody Sways, good morning from, uh, but Jody's probably watching us from Barry. A uh, friend, of course. Good realtor out there as well. Good morning from uh, This is from Wanda. What is the best way to deal with weeds that are growing in your gardens despite mulch? So the key about weeding, and uh, I'm guilty of this because I have some weeding to do because I was away for a period of time, uh, and uh, there's some weeds out there that have matured. And the issue when you have a weed that's matured is it has developed its flowers and seeds. So a reminder, every plant out there, its goal is to survive. And really, that's the, the goal of any living thing is to survive. How do plants survive? They actually put a flower on, even though we're like, oh, it's so pretty. The purpose of that flower is not for beauty. The purpose for that flower is reproduction. So if we look at the flower, and I was doing this with a friend last night, we were pulling flowers apart and taking a look at seeds and talking about spreading them around. That's the purpose of that flower is to support it. With weeds, if we allow weeds to get mature and go to flower and go to seed, then all we're doing is allowing seeds to be broadcast around. So the key with weeding or reducing the amount of weeding is to try to do weeding fairly consistently. As soon as your gardens fill up and there's no vacant space, no area where seed can make contact to soil, then you're not going to have as many weeds. So thicker gardens actually have less weeds that are out there. Mulch will reduce weeds, of course. But right now I know in some of the areas of Newfoundland where there's actually some fires that are happening, they're actually telling people to pull mulch away from their gardens because of the worry and concern of that. So if you're watching us in the East Coast and or the West Coast, there's concerns with mulch. Uh, but weeding consistently is really key. And then pulling weeds before they get too big, mature, and go to flower. Super key. Uh, when you're removing weeds, if you can put them into a container right away, because if their seeds are sitting there, we're not broadcasting the seed across. And the best time to weed is when your gardens are wet. So after a rain, because the weeds are easiest to pick up at that time. Uh, we got another question here. Good morning this morning from Morrisburg. Can't wait to hear about your trip. Uh, river cruising is the best. Uh, once again, we talked a little bit about it at the beginning of the uh, little broadcast that we have here. I'll recap next week. River cruising is something that I've never experienced before. And I will tell you that it's something that's amazing is that you can hop on a great boat and then every day you're waking up or every other day you're waking up at a new destination. So you're not packing, you're staying within that. And then you have an option of tours. You have great food. The, the staff at Emerald Cruise, I was on Emerald Cruise, the boat that I was on it was called the Luna. Brand new boat, beautiful boat. Uh, it's a really neat way to take in a lot of parts of the world overall, and they really do take good care of you. Carla saying good morning to you from Niagara Falls. Uh, we got Penny Moore saying good morning from Newmarket this morning. Uh, Ingrid, what do you got going on in Aurelia? Hello from Aurelia. Uh, my astilbes, so astilbe is a shade growing plant that generally has almost like a fluffy like bloom. Uh, beautiful. My favorite variety of astilbe is astilbe sprite. Always get brown leaves on them. I put a new soil last year and they still get brown leaves on them. They do bloom, but I'm concerned. What do you think that might be the case that, about the reason why this is? So the browning of leaves is generally sun scorch. Uh, so getting a little bit of sunburn uh, during hot, humid weather where we have warmer nights. And there's really like a plant, ideally, our outdoor plants, what they want is they want a nice warm day with a fairly consistent frequency of rain. But then they want a cooler evening because with a cooler overnight temperature, plants actually rest. They go to bed. If they're warm at night, they really don't have a good rest period. So that reverse differential of temperature, meaning warm day, cool night, super important. 
So the reason why that browning of leaves is just probably the hot, humid temperatures, or it's just getting too much sun. So it has nothing to do with soil. It has nothing to do with anything. Will it die? No, probably not whatsoever. If it's in a part shade to shaded area with morning sun, it's going to be fine. If it is getting sun from 11 to 6, that's hot afternoon sun. It's direct. It's always going to brown. So move it to a new location. Move in fall. Good morning this morning from Walkerton. Good morning to you, Susan. Uh, Dennis. You, Dennis, what's going on? Uh, good morning from Barry. Barry. Uh, still can't believe I had to harvest eight heads of broccoli two weeks ago. And boy, is it tasty. Also the earliest in my history. Of course, yes. Um, temperatures have been warm. Broccoli, beautiful. Bro broccoli is actually a floret. You know, the, the broccoli that's coming up, it's a flower head, even though we're consuming it as a vegetable. If we allow it to sit there too long, it'll actually go to flower and then go to yellow. And you'll see these yellow flowers and it's <laughs> terrible. Um, I really encourage you, broccoli, everybody always eats the top of the broccoli, but that stem, if you remove um, the skin off that stem, that center stem is actually very tasty. You can cut it in little cubes. You could dip it into tzatziki. Beautiful. My dad actually called it struntz. He would always say, Frank, you want the struntz? Uh, that was when we were growing broccoli. We used to grow broccoli. Things are earlier this year. We're in peach season right now. We're in nectarine season right now. Buy local, grow local, grow your own. But if you don't, go out there, support your local farmers. We got so much food. And the other part too is our food here is really well priced. Um, Nancy saying good morning this morning. How are you doing today? Uh, we got a shout out to uh, Stratford this morning from Leanne. <laughs> Uh, Stratford, beautiful community. The Stratford Festival, if you ever have not gone, I'd really encourage you to do. There's a little cheese shop on the main street that I used to visit all the time. I haven't been in a while. I used to attend the uh, Stratford Garlic Festival, which is in the fall. If you're a fan of garlic, go check it out. Cool. Really cool. Learn about, mm, learn about garlic, but also buy a whole bunch of different garlic products that are out there as well. Um, here we go. Uh, Pamela. Good morning, Frankie. My tomato plants are thriving in growth and color. Small flowers and a couple of tiny tomatoes. Still green, though. Is this normal? Depends on the variety and depends on the amount of moisture that you're getting as well. What you're going to be seeing is a lot of the times we're getting inconsistent moisture. So tomatoes are actually, they get a water, they're fairly wet, and then they go dry. So that can actually stunt the size of the flower. It's usually a size of the... Um, and then if the tomato is not sizing and staying green, it's probably a lack of water. So I would increase your watering. If by chance you have missed a bunch of watering and then you start watering and you notice your tomatoes have sized, started to color, but on the bottom they have a brownish kind of scarring, that brownish scarring is blossom end rot. Blossom end rot is caused by inconsistent watering and a calcium deficiency. So what I would really recommend is for you to remove those tomatoes that have the scarring on the bottom the new tomatoes, if you're watering well and using a calcium infused fertilizer, will do well. Uh, you can look to Scott's. Scott's actually Miracle Grow actually has a slow release fertilizer with a red top on the on the thing on the top that is, and um, on, on the the lid is red, uh, and that's got calcium in it as well. <clears throat> so Jillian saying, "What's happening to my lawn? There is cobwebs appearing. That could be sod webworms. So the sod webworms." Uh, do exactly that. They put that webbing that's down. There's Bacillus thurgensis, so you can actually use uh, even some uh, different um, nematodes to take care of that. So uh, I would encourage you to take a look and even maybe remove the area where you're seeing some of that webbing and just kind of just kind of take the sod off in that area and dig a little bit down and see if you see any worms per se or even, even grubs at that time. Uh, and then you would then do a, put a Bacillus thurgensis down, a BTK that would help. Um, uh, the uh, grub be gone could even cure that as well. Could take care of that a little bit as well. Uh, so there you go with some questions as well. Good morning, Frankie from Prince Edward County. Christine, Christine was uh, on the trip, and Christine, thank you so much. Uh, where was that? I have that book somewhere. Oh, maybe I, I've been looking at it upstairs. Super thoughtful. Uh, actually, is it right here? Where did I put it? Hmm. Oh, there it is. As I'm walking around the office. You can see my camera following me. You can see my messy office. I got to clean some things, but it's okay. That's what you got to do. Um, so Floriad, boom. To uh, a shout out to Christine because Christine was super thoughtful and had everybody on the cruise send me a whole bunch of notes uh, about the cruise itself. And um, we really became a great little family that was there. Had a great time. Uh, and Christine, you were fantastic. Uh, it was really good to see your passion for plants. I, I can't imagine how many photos you took because it seemed like you took a lot of photos, like a lot. 
Uh, I did too. I took a lot, but I think you took a lot more than I took. That's what I think. Uh, and good morning. Lovely rain here in Woodville on a Thursday. Acre looking good. Woodville, beautiful little community as well. Be nice to see some rain here. We haven't got any. Uh, another question this morning uh, we got from Jacqueline. Our pepper plants are uh, false blossoms. Uh, what to do to get fruit? So what they mean by a false blossom is that uh, they're really not bearing fruit whatsoever. Uh, and that's pollination. So sometimes you can even think it's a false blossom. But a lot of the times that's where you actually don't have any pollinators that are around. So encouraging pollinators to your garden can really help you as well. Removing some of those blossoms that are sitting there right now. Shaking the plant can simply just put pollen into the air to actually help it set fruit. So what you're looking to do is for those blooms to set fruit overall. Uh, because of the timing of year, if it's a hot pepper, you may actually have some challenges uh, where you may not get any peppers this year because we are now going into the second week of August, depending upon where you live in this country. You know, into September, we can start thinking about frost warnings, but daylight hours are getting shorter. I would encourage you to remove some of the blooms that are there. And then what I would re really encourage you is when it does set some new flowers, just to give the plant a little bit of a shake or even take a Q-tip and go from flower to flower with that Q-tip. That's such sometimes enough to help set that pollen that's out there. Uh, Marlene. Hey, Frankie. Found out my orange bugs with black spots are the European fire bug. Okay, European firebug. I'm not overly familiar with a European firebug, so I'm just gonna European firebug. I'm just gonna look this up really quickly. Oh, yeah. So the European firebugs uh, are quite common. Uh, these guys here are something that you see quite a bit um, in many areas. Uh, actually, I can actually, so the other viewers can see what the heck I'm talking about as well. So I just go to images here, and then I'm just going to share my screen for you guys as well so that you guys can see what Sir Frank is talking about. Okay, there we go. Share. Boom. So this is the European firebug. Um, these guys here have become fairly an invasive species. You can see the ones right here are having a little bit of fun. Uh, that there is how they mate. And you can see when they do mate, how they get going. Um, a lot of the times these guys here are usually eating on decaying materials. Um, well, the best kind of use if you see them in and around your home is just to vacuum them up. They're cyclical, meaning that they will last for the entire season overall. They are fairly, fairly menacing. And there you go where they're new to Toronto, but this was a few, they have been around Toronto for quite some time. So there's actually a Toronto Star article as well. Um, should we be worried? Um, you shouldn't be worried. These guys here will remedy themselves. And I will tell you that over time, everything will take care of itself. So thanks for, uh, sharing that with us. I'm just going to, uh, where are we here? We're going to go stop sharing screen. Boom. And there we go. I'm back. Hi, how are you? Um, let's go through here. There's a question here that we have about a Japanese maple. So Johnny, Hey Johnny. Uh, my Japanese maple leaves are turning brown and falling off. I've been watering it regularly, trying to save it. What now? So this is the same thing, which we were talking about the still be. During the hot, humid conditions that we get without any te cooler temperatures at night really puts plants under stress, even though you're watering and a reminder to water deeply. The reason why its leaves are turning brown and falling off is it's going under sun scorch. So if we look at Japanese maple sun scorch, I can actually even do that really quickly. Let me just do this so I can show you. Japanese maple sun scorch. Um, just to show you uh, what the heck I'm talking about. So, and this is probably exactly what's happening with you. I'm just going to share my screen here again, guys. Bear with me as I'm a one-man show, don't you know? Uh, boom. And then we're going to go. Here we go. So this is uh, what sun scorch looks on a Japanese maple. And this is just due to hot, excessively hot, dry conditions and maybe a little bit too much sunshine. Is this harmful? This will put this plant under stress. The greatest concern that we will have thereafter is making sure that this, this maple does not go into winter. I'll be back. 
there I am, um, go into winter sitting dry, so under stress. So what the most important watering will be for you is this fall, making sure that it goes with a deep and frequent, like a soaking of watering in the fall. That's going to be key because if it goes, if it's already had a stressful summer, then it goes into winter sitting under stress. What will happen is if we have a cold winter, the severe winter, it actually could be enough to kill it. So the key is don't fertilize. We actually want it to slow down and grow, especially maples. We want them to slow down and grow. We want to continue watering. Any dead branches, remove those dead branches. It may even drop all its leaves, and you actually may even see it put its leaves back on. It's quite common. That's not a lot to worry about right now. Matthew, my buddy Matthew. Hey, bud. Welcome back, Matthew. He's got some news to tell me. Matthew is the collector. So many different autographs, and he's, he's not shy. He'll reach out to anybody to see if they'll send him an autograph, and it's amazing, the autograph collection. He's, he's going to be one of those guys that goes down in the record books, is probably holding the most amount of autographs, and Matthew's a super cool guy. Leslie Clark, welcome back. I have two kinds of beautiful hydrangeas. Beautiful. Right now, my, uh, my limelights, my little limelights are starting to bloom beautifully. I have no clue what type they are. How do I know if and when to prune them? So if they bloom a cone shape, if they bloom white, those are blooming on new wood. So in the fall, you can, after the flowers are done, you can cut them right down to the ground. Fine if you miss it in the fall, but I encourage you to cut them in the fall. You can then do it in the spring. If your hydrangeas are blue and or pink and they have a larger leaf and that leaf is a little bit deeper, green and flossier, and almost that leaf itself is a little leathery, that's a macrophilia, that macrophilia hydrangea is one that blooms on old wood. So I encourage you in the fall just to remove the flower heads that are there because the flower heads are snow catchers and they can bend them up. In the spring, what you'll do is you'll wait it to wait for that plant to bud out. And after it buds out, then you'll just remove any dead wood because it blooms on old wood. So we don't cut it. We re remove next year's flowers uh, now. Okay, Debbie. Hi, Debbie. I have seven hydrangeas and only two of them flower each year. What can I do to help these along? So sometimes the hydrangeas may not flower due to the amount of shade that's grown in the area. Uh, it could be improper pruning, which I just described. There are better varieties that are out there. If these guys are not blooming and you're providing them with the right location and they actually have the right amount of light, but they're not blooming, a lot of the macrophilias, the pinks and blues, in my experience, just don't perform as well as like a limelight, as a PG, as a fire and ice, uh, even Bobo. Bobo is a really cool, short little hydrangea fantastic varieties. Those guys there perform. So if a plant hasn't performed to you, sometimes instead of you saying, I just want to give it care, I just want to give it care, it's better off to see if we can get rid of it and find the right plant for the right place. Uh, a lot of the times people are even, even my friend last night was like, hey, I don't want to prune this. What do I do with this side? Hey, you know, by pruning, giving it a haircut, it's like you with a split end. Sometimes your hair gets split ends. We got to cut it to make it nice, tighter, make it kind of push out new growth, make it have sometimes... We need to be trimmed back so we can grow further. Same thing with plants, so don't be aware. But if plants haven't performed in three years, uh, either you move them to a new location to see if they perform or you get rid of them. That's just my philosophy. Uh, there's the same thing. Uh, earwigs, driving me crazy. Cindy, uh, earwigs drive everybody crazy. That is a folklore, by the way. If you think that earwigs, when you sleep with climb into your ear, folklore. Good name, though. Good name for a creepy looking bug. That bug is a nocturnal bug that eats on decaying material. Often when you have earwigs, somebody lives close to a wood pile or lives close to the forest or has a lot of bark mulch in because that's providing those earwigs with a location that they can go and hide. When the sun comes up, they're like, ooh, sun, I don't like the sun. So then they'll go underneath to that kind of wet decaying environment and that's perfect for them to actually have more earwigs. So you got to get rid of that environment. That's one way to get rid of them. Another way that you can get rid of, rid of earwigs, i got to learn how to speak, Frank. Uh, the reason how you can get rid of earwigs is we can take a newspaper roll. You're going to roll that roll up. You're going to put a elastic, elastic band around that roll. You're going to moisten that little roll of newspaper, and you're going to pop it in the area where you see the earwigs. When the sun comes up, the earwigs are going to go into those rolls and hide. What you do is then you lift those rolls up and you just discard them and you can get rid of earwigs. You can also get rid of earwigs with diatomaceous earth, which is the same thing, the crushed shells, placing that in the areas, and that will really help you as well. But the key is, is to make sure that you get rid of the environment that's housing them, that's housing them. So we got another little shout out this morning as well. And this one here is from Stratford. Hope 
You had a great trip. Lois, thank you so much. It was great. You know, travel's always a little bit challenging, but overall it was great. Uh, can we add summer grass fertilizer if it's going brown? I don't want to kill my lawn. So Deborah, just before a rain, you could still uh, put on a summer guard fertilizer. So that's the Scott's Turf Builder Summer Guard Fertilizer. It's in the orange bag. Put it on before rain. Or if you do apply it, make sure that you then water thereafter. If you put it down, you didn't water and it was dry for several days, that's when you could actually have some issues. Cindy Wright. Hey, Jimmy. Good morning, Mickey from Kempville. Kempville, just out by, uh, just south of uh, Ottawa. I have uh, red aphids that are devouring tick seed variety only. I have uh, sprayed uh, strongly with water and also we got it in and sick aside of soap. Nothing is working. Any other ideas that I continue uh, that I could try? So continue doing that. Continue doing those methods. Encouraging ladybugs to the area is the other way that you can kind of get rid of them as well. Um, Ladybugs are key. So you can even purchase ladybugs, but I would continuing uh, continue some applications in a seven day interval of the bug be gone and or insecticidal soap. Bug be gone and insecticidal soap, pretty much the same thing, but you're going to have to do those in intervals. Uh, and then on occasion in between those intervals, just wash the plants with um, a high pressure wash that'll actually help you out uh, to get rid of some of those aphids. And then if you can encourage ladybugs or even purchase some ladybugs, that'll also help you as well. So those are some tips for you. Um, another question that we have here, Mary Beth, what veggies can you plant in August? Great question, by the way. So uh, as we get into the second, third week of August, we are starting to get into fall -like conditions. So we can actually sow some seeds. If we were able to find lettuce plants, we can plant lettuce plants. If we were to find kale, we can plant kale. But right now, if we have some seeds or are able to get some seeds, we can put radishes in now. We can put another row of spinach in right now. We can do, it, do some leaf lettuce. We could do that as well. Uh, and then as well, you could do um, even to, uh, some bok choy. You could do any of those quicker growing spring-like plants. But really, radishes, Swiss chard, sowing in some leaf lettuce, beautiful. So that's some good tips for you overall. Uh, we got a good morning from Toronto this morning. Good morning to you. We got another shout out this morning from uh, Arn Prior, which is just outside of Ottawa. I've been to their own prior Canadian tire. Um, Mel, good morning. Frankie from your hometown, B-Town, Bradford. Love it. Hey, next weekend, Carrot Fest in Bradford. You better believe it. If you like carrots or you want to come and just hang out in Bradford and walk the streets of Bradford, I think it's next weekend on uh, Friday and Saturday. Carrot Fest with our hometown, our hometown mascot named Willie the Carrot. I'm not lying. I'm telling you. Yeah. Uh, Janice from Oakville. My daylilies look dead. What should I do? Uh, so your daylilies, of course, have probably finished their bloom period. My favorite variety of a daylily is Celadora. It's a nice short blooming, re-blooming uh, daylily. If some of those areas, those leaves are kind of browning and dying, just cut it back. Just cut them back. Give them a trim. Make sure you continue to water. If they've been in that same area for over five years, this fall, I would encourage you to lift them, divide them, and then replant them in areas, maybe even in the same area. And if you had more, uh, sometimes that, that'll need. But you know what? They can kick back. And right now, things are putting themselves in the dormancy because we've just been so hot, so dry that's out there. Daily is pretty tough. You can see them growing in ditch banks. So I wouldn't be overly concerned. Uh, we got a question here too. Uh, good morning, Frank. I came home to my pumpkin plant covered in blooms. Should I pinch them off or leave them to grow? I would pinch them off. I would actually pinch probably 50% of them off. Uh, that'll actually allow that plant to actually sustain some of the other fruit that it will form that's over there, but I would pinch them off for sure. Sue's, hey, and Susan Poff. Yeah, so Sue as well, also the one that joined us on the, on the trip as well. Uh, Summerside Landscaping up in, uh, she's up in Perry Sound area. So uh, if you're in that area, check out Sue. And Sue is a fantastic gardener, super passionate. She actually spent a longer time at Floriad. When we were at Floriad, it was really hot, super hot, like crazy hot. Why did my two-year-old hydrangea not bloom? This Carla's asking. Uh, it did plant the first, it, it did the first year I planted, but nothing now. Lovely green leaves though. Uh, if it's a macrophilia. Uh, macrophilias, if they're not in the, per if it's a, some of these, if you're not zone hardy, if you're just on the margin of zone hardiness, that macrophilia, even though like I was just in the Netherlands and, and I, the Netherlands was hydrangea built. Like I'm meaning there's hydrangeas everywhere. They got like, they got like macrophilia, large leaf hydrangeas that are like hugely in top, beautiful in bloom, but they don't get the cold overnight temperatures that we do in the winter. 
And macrophilia hydrangeas, if they get those cold temperatures, the flower buds that are sitting there get zipped. That means killed. And then you'll just get deep green leaves. That's why I would encourage some of the PGs, the limelights, those guys there are varieties that are better performing and that will work. They won't give you the pinks, but they will work for you as well. We got a shout out this morning as well from uh, Oakville. Good morning, Rosa. We got another shout out this morning from Kathy. Good morning, Frankie. Squirrels. What do I do about squirrels eating my pears and now eating my tomatoes? Thank you. Uh, so sometimes if we can't beat them, we feed them. We can sometimes put blood meal down. That will help out as well. Um, they will really tend to go over towards tomatoes. There's animal be gone that you can spray, but then it's going to leave a residual taste so that you don't really want to do that. We can always put a little bit of chicken wire up and around to actually keep them out. But sometimes just leaving them, you can actually get some uh, dried corn. You can go to your birding supply store or even just go to a farmer and get some dried corn, put that on the far end of the property. And they're going to go to that versus your garden overall. Put a little bit of blood meal down to actually fertilize the lawn, uh, fertilize the garden. And then that's some ways that you can discourage them as well. So I went over 30 minutes today. I'm at about 35 because I started a little bit early. The time now is 9.31. So that means I'm going to log off for the day as I got to go pick up my man Matheson this morning. Gavin's at camp. I'm going to have a good day with him. I'm going to go to the greenhouse this afternoon, see what's going on, what's growing on. Uh, the mums are looking good. Fall chrysanthemums and poinsettias are growing. Yeah, you probably hate to hear that. So uh, once again, hey, thanks for joining me here each and every Sunday. I hope I shared some uh, motivation to you today. I hope today that uh, you maybe got some tips and tricks to make your garden maybe just that little much better or just maybe you smiled. And that's the key. A reminder, gardening to me is one of the greatest things in the world. The reason why gardening is so good is at the end, if you're lucky, you get tomatoes. And who doesn't love tomatoes? This guy? I'm thinking I'm going to have a tomato bocconcini salad today. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah. I hope you guys have a great day. Fresh basil from the garden, too, I'll have with it.